So what you're about to see is a um, mock interview for MML. Now at Keys, you would usually have two interviews, so one in each of the languages that you're interviewing for, which would each last between 20 and 25 minutes. But we decided that because we've got Ruby here today and because we're all here, we we're going to carry on for a little bit longer um, just to give you a little bit more insight into the kind of conversation you might be able to um, expect. And as it happens, this will be the this is the same length as our standard um, podcast interview. And we are going to be releasing this in podcast format as well. Bear in mind that Ruby has benefited from a year of teaching from me and Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, of course, she's going to be working at a different level than we might expect for someone um, coming to an interview with us early on, usually in year 13. Um, and just be aware that in the second half, we do discuss the passage in English. And of course, the discussion is at a much higher level than it would be if we were discussing it in Spanish, French or Russian, for example. OK, Ruby, well, thank you very much for coming to see us today. Um, my name is Jeff McGuire. I'm a fellow in Spanish here and I'm joined by... My name is Rebecca Subden and I'm the fellow in French here. Mm -hmm. I'm a fellow in French here at Keys. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so just to let you know what will happen over the next 25 minutes or so, we'll spend the first half talking about your personal statement, some of the things you've watched, some of the things you've seen, uh, and really some of the reasons why you want to study Spanish with us mm -hmm. in Keys. And then the second half will move on to discuss the passage that you've been having a look at. Can I just check you have got the passage and you spent 30 minutes reading it? Yes, I have. Yeah, good. Um, well, there'll be plenty of time at the end of the interview for you to ask us any questions. Mm -hmm. But if Dr. Sugden and I say anything on the way through that, that doesn't make sense, that you know, if we use a word that you've never heard before, then please just ask us to rephrase or explain and we'd be very happy to do that. Okay. okay? Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Sugden. Great. So, Ruby, we're going to kick off um, by talking a little bit about your personal statement in the first instance. And then in the second half of the interview, we'll move on to talking about the passage that you've prepared. Mm -hmm. So you're probably expecting this question, uh, <laughs> but let's let, let, let's kick off with it. Um, so to start, could you begin by telling us what attracts you to studying modern languages and, and Spanish in particular? Yeah, no, um, I think for me, I really, really like Kind of the interdisciplinary nature of languages in general but specifically at Cambridge. Um, I think especially during secondary school I've had a variety of interests and I think languages always kind of really attracted me because you have the ability to study so much like mm. literature, mm -hmm. film, current affairs and like international relations and politics and I think kind of that multiplicity of the degree is what really attracts me to doing like modern languages here at Cambridge um, and just kind of Spanish in particular. I grew up in London in a really multicultural area and like both my parents don't speak any other languages at home but Spanish um, as a spoken language was something I was like exposed to at a really young age because my childhood best friend was half Panamanian so her mom would always speak Spanish mm. around the home and I remember just feeling like very at home in that environment first of all but also kind of a little bit left out in some ways because mm. I couldn't always mm. understand what her mom was mm. saying and it was just such a rich culture that I was aware of from a young age so when I got to start studying it at year seven I was like super super excited by Spanish and I've just continued it in education since because it's just been a really really important subject and language to me like on a personal level as well as it just mm. interests me more mm. generally so yeah mm. great mm. thank you um i mean i wonder if i could just ask you um before we hand over to our proper spanish specialist um <laughs> if i could just ask you um about one of the things you mentioned in your in your personal statement mm -hmm. and you talk about how you're you say i'm fascinated by how the visual arts mirror cultures yeah um and i wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that word kind of mirror mm. and, and the yeah. relationship you might um, see cultural objects as having with the, their context. Yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting thing to explore. And I think especially when I got to A-level and have been studying film in that, that's kind of when I really understood that filmmaking and what it means to kind of have visual arts in different cultures looks very different from one mm. country to another mm. or one like nationality to another. Um, so I think like, there's so many ways in which culture can be mirrored on screen or just in the arts in general stuff that you physically look at but I think especially with cinema I studied a lot of like Almodovar films mm -hmm. um, at A-level and I'm really a big fan of him as a director and there was just something for the first time watching Almodovar as a director that I noticed considering I grew up watching a lot of like British film and documentary there's just something that felt very different about the way he films his um or directs and like has his films look on screen and mm. i think a lot of it has to do with color first of all mm. i think um in the very few times i have visited spain i've always just felt like there's a lot of kind of vivacity and color within 
um, regional areas and cities so I think like in terms of architecture stuff like that and kind of the artwork that you find in architecture in Spain it's very colourful compared to some places in the UK that I've grown up for example mm. and I think little elements like that as part of um, Spain's cultural heritage um, and things that are really integral to like their national identity and what was really good at manipulating and showing in a subtle way on screen mm. so like mm. I think colour is a really big part of that mm -hmm. in terms of fashion and the way especially like the women are stylized in this mm. films like ones that kind of come to my mind first and foremost are Volver and Todo Sobre Mi Madre mm. um, because those just have women in very colourful outfits mm. and really co colourful imagery and I think it's got a lot to celebrate like the passion of kind of womanhood specifically for a Spanish woman mm. um, and yeah and just kind of giving allusions to more wider parts of Spanish culture and like there's mm. kind of the perception that a lot about and Spanish culture is very open mm. um, yeah like very open and bold and I think like seeing that on screen it's kind of hard sometimes to articulate but i think it's very much there and like hard to ignore once you kind of compare a really iconic quintessentially mm. spanish director like El Modavar with other films you may watch in hollywood or in it's, the uk i mean it's interesting you, you used a couple of verbs there you mm. said uh manipulate yeah. and stylize it yeah. right mm. and in some senses you might say what El Modavar does is exaggerate yeah. spanish culture rather than mirror it so mm. why, why do you think he does exaggerate it in the way that he does why does he manipulate and stylize color in that way I think that's a really good question. I think there's a lot for me that when I was studying our mod of ours and work, I like to read a lot of interviews with him. And I think from what I've understood from why he does his work, a lot of it's like an evocation of his kind of pride and love for the regional culture of Spain or mm. where he's grown up and like the aspects of his childhood that he associates with being Spanish um, and wanting to kind of display his love and admiration for that, especially like with the women that kind of grew up and raised him mm. so I think a lot of that exaggeration is feels a bit of like a really just kind of bold mm. display of kind of admiration yeah and love for the culture and I think in terms of like I said he ha he talks a lot about women in his life being really important like for example Volver is a very personal piece to him because it's about women from Castilla-La Mancha mm. where he grew up and I think all of that is kind of like almost mirroring the memories he would have had mm. that just feel like kind of snippets very vivid in his memory and like making the women that he's depicting on screen mm. seem larger than mm. life and like um very full and rounded not only in their characterization but also in the visuality mm. of that so yeah so so do you think then it's the kind of mirror that you know you might look at yourself in in the morning or is it a different kind of mirror that mm. that might distort mm. as well as reflect that's a really good question i think I'm leaning slightly more to it's, it's a hard question to answer mm. but I think mm. it's I'm leaning slightly more towards the idea of distortion mm -hmm. and I say that because I think looking at film and looking at the way one perceives themselves and I think this is especially true when like considering the study of other cultures and other languages like I think there's sometimes a bit of a disconnect compared to how we view ourselves mm. and like how and we are actually viewed in a realistic sense and that, that feels quite meta and like a bit over exaggerated but I think um especially yeah stuff like with language studies and like talking about this mirror and reflection on the way we do ourselves or the way we view individuals versus reality like there's a lot that can be said in terms of language study and like other cultures that relates to kind of stereotypes and mm. ideas of what we think um, a French person looks like or a Spanish person mm. looks like or what it means to be British for example and that goes to the visual it goes to the social etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think like for example when I look at myself in the mirror and I think like I'm a Londoner I'm from the UK I might have a certain like view of myself but maybe to someone else that like that means a different thing like mm. they wouldn't look at me and think like I'm British or a Londoner and then equally what I would perceive a traditionally Spanish woman to be like a Spanish woman looking at themselves in the mirror would probably see the key aspects of their Spanish identity quite differently to me as an outsider mm. um so yeah I'm not sure if that completely answered your question yeah, but, yeah uh, that's, that's great thank you Ruby um, yeah. yeah I wonder if we could I mean one of the things that caught my eye in your personal statement was that you've read a Garcia Marquez novel yeah. um <laughs> El en su Labarindo. Mm -hmm. and I wonder actually a lot of the words we've just been discussing actually apply to that novel yeah. as well so ideas about manipulation about exaggeration mm. about presenting an identity about mirroring society sure. um what kind of what kind of entry into history does that novel give us is it manipulation mm. of history is it an insight into history yeah i think the key words and then linking them to that novel is quite an interesting way to look at it because i also think it's coming from a unique angle but is actually really useful for that novel in particular because obviously um 
the novel follows the life of Simon Bolivar, who is kind of like a very iconic figure mm. in Latin American history. But this idea of kind of manipulation and mirroring, I think it's interesting when we kind of talk about post-colonial theory and stuff more in the current day at how we look at reflecting on historical figures that maybe 50 years ago how people of my grandparents generation would view Simone Bolivar would differ a lot today because mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing more and more like criticisms of kind of he liberated Latin America but like what did that mean in the grand scheme of things and was there ways in which he kind of um, collaborated with um, European interest and mm. like was there ways in which he was actually seeking to defend and look after like the indigenous communities that he was claiming to represent when liberating us in America. Well, let's think about that in terms of the novel itself yeah. because actually it's a, it's a really interesting portrayal of Simon Bolivar and actually yeah. caused quite a lot of controversy when it was published. Yeah. So is this is this a positive portrayal? Is it a negative portrayal? How, do, how are we supposed to read the character of the general? That's, that's a really good question. I, I would dare, I would like harbour a guess and say that I don't actually think it's meant to be seen as either positive or negative, but more of like a humanistic approach at mm -hmm. looking at the character of Simón Bolívar or like the person of Simón Bolívar, because I think a lot of the novel and the way it's written in terms of a narrative perspective is seeking to kind of explore this inner turmoil within himself, mm -hmm. like this fallen hero kind of mm -hmm. image. And I think... On one hand, that would be difficult for some people who have very strong views about the liberation of Latin America to see like this really key iconic figure as mm. like a fallen hero. Like that's quite distressing mm. for maybe some people mm. reading. So, the so novel. give me some examples of how he's a fallen hero in the novel. Well, I mean, there's kind of the deterioration of his health uh -huh. um, specifically, and I think a lot of it's got to do with like masculine power and this kind of idea of like a pa power dynamic. So the fact that he kind of falls to illness and is having to flee a country from X, like he's fleeing the country that he originally liberated shows mm. like a rapid decline in power. Um, what, what illness is he suffering from? Um, I've, I'm not sure if I remember, I'm so sorry, because I haven't read the book in a while. Is it? It's not cholera, it's... Um, it's a bit of a trick, trick question, because we don't really, really know, know mm -hmm. what illness he's suffering from. Yeah. So the next question is, why do you think it's important that we don't know what specifically the illness is? That's a really good question. I think... Um, I think the illness, as we were just kind of discussing in terms of what it represents to him as a character, is more important on a metaphorical or like mm -hmm. hypothetical level. Um, because it's kind of, I think the kind of unknown nature of it plagues him even more because mm -hmm. he can't really like distinguish what's wrong with him and then use his power and like resources to kind mm. of seek out a cure mm. because he doesn't know what it is. And like that, I think kind of um, scratches away at him and mm. his own sense mm -hmm. of like self worth and power as this liberator even more because he can't. Yeah, let, let, the... but let's think about mm -hmm. specific examples. Yeah. How does it affect him as the novel progresses? How does his ill, Ill health affect him? Um, so I think it kind of inhibits what he can do as an individual. I think he has to rely on like the um, kind of advisor roles in his life a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it kind of. it. The, is, from what I remember of the novel, there's a lot talking about like that it kind of affects his memory as well. Good, it's, yeah. If you see this kind of like flow in between of his past memories interlinking with his present, and it's kind of almost indistinguishable from a reader's perspective as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like what is the present and what's his memory, and like how mm. much can we trust what we're hearing of his memories? And I think that's quite interesting as well, playing into like the way Garcia Marquez normally writes because. Mm. Yeah, it's, it was interesting to me because it's one of his only novels that people will say with their full chest, like, isn't magical realism. But mm -hmm. I think that kind of aspect of the novel is a really interesting allusion to magical realism mm. without, like, objectively being a magically realist novel. Um, so I think, yeah, like, the idea of memory and, like, the impression that I got from reading it was that... Um, this illness is kind of triggering this kind of hazy memory and mm. intermixing of the past and the present. But obviously that's a really strong um, attribute to the novel in a narrative sense. Mm -hmm. But I think it's quite interesting to consider as well from the fact that it's like, it's spurred by something health related. Yeah, so, so, mm -hmm. so we have uh, we have problems with physical health, yeah. quite obviously, we, but we also have psychological yeah. health problems. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, that, is that how we're supposed to read the labyrinth? That he's, I mean, the title mm -hmm. of the novel is the general in, in his yeah. labyrinth, labyrinth yeah. right? Why, why is it his labyrinth and not just a labyrinth? It's, that's, a really, that's a really good question. I think in so many readings of it, it can be quite undetermined because mm. when I first read the novel, it was, to me, the labyrinth had a lot to do with like the journey he was making. So good, obviously yeah. mm -hmm. the 
general was trying to leave Latin America and make it to Europe, which feels a bit contradictory because of like him. Why, why does it feel contradictory? Well, I mean, because he's a liberator of Latin America and he free, he's meant to be freeing um, Latin America from Spanish oppression and he's moving to Europe, which is obviously closely associated with colonialism. Mm. Mm. Um, but there's there's that aspect of it so like in many ways i interpreted the labyrinth kind of being this you, they talk a lot in the novel about him making a journey across um the river to get to mm -hmm. the border and then obviously he would have to go on to make a journey to europe and he never quite makes it to europe why, why does he not make it to europe because he dies before he uh yeah mm -hmm. why, why, i mean he he's at the port <laughs> for a while yeah. why does he not make it onto the, to the from ship from what i remember from the novel i think a lot of his original kind of supporters turn against him and like those in his inner circle kind mm. of rat him out and he's prohibited from like getting on the ship and then like dies before he's yeah. able to leave yeah um so I mean, there, there are lots of problems there, there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> in, in there. the first sense of the ship the ship mm -hmm. doesn't arrive mm -hmm. he loses his passport or, yeah um so there are also other actions that 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 lead him to be unable to get back to europe yeah. and i mean you, you said there that it's interesting that we're, we're talking about someone who liberates mm -hmm. a certain region from european colonialism mm -hmm. but then wants to go back i mean how do you read not just that but the, the fact that he doesn't get back before he dies i think yeah i think there is something kind of quite narratively nice about it in a sense that because he doesn't make it back to europe i think there's kind of a lot of co contemplation to be had about what it's trying to say in terms of like it's got so much to do with colonialism and the way that we can now study historical the figures that were implicated in colonialism and kind of it's it's really easy to sit here in the 21st century in 2024 and say stuff like you know well simon bolivar wasn't much of like a liberator because he wanted to go back to europe and he mm. made that some mm. concessions to um the spanish that he's claiming to free people from but obviously with the context of the time that's not as clear cut of an answer or way to mm. look at things yeah um and i think there's some implication in that with him trying to reach um europe because from what I'm aware of his background, like he was of Spanish blood but raised in the Americas. So I think you could interpret his failure to reach Europe as he's obviously throughout his life um, taken to the freedom and like liberation of mm -hmm. the American part of mm -hmm. his heritage. But there is kind of like the Spanish part of his heritage that he never quite touched or reached or he was able to connect with or um be accepted by maybe mm. in some ways mm. that is kind of represented potentially in the fact mm. he never meet, reaches europe or spain yeah. um but equally there's this idea of him becoming a dictator after he liberates spain and his liberation sorry not liberation of spain liberation of latin america in that liberation after assuming this kind of role of a dictator in many ways people could interpret the way he led these countries and like his regime to mm -hmm. be so authoritarian that it was like mimicking the rules of his european counterparts that he was mm -hmm. claiming to free mm -hmm. people from and then the fact that he doesn't reach europe by the end of the novel mm -hmm. is that like despite liberating latin america he was trying to obtain this kind of image of like a european leader of that mm. all-out power but yeah. never quite got there mm. um yeah sorry can i can i pick up on one of the the the, the expressions you used and you said it was it was quite narratively neat <laughs> yeah yeah but i i suppose there's also a sense in which um the trajectory isn't completed yeah right there's there's not quite an open-endedness to it but it doesn't tie off all the loose ends really <laughs> in terms of him following me expected trajectory mm -hmm. so could you talk a little bit more about about what you mean then by by narratively neat yeah i think it's it's i love talking about it um the more and more i'm reading and feel like i'm learning more about how to interpret reading because i think especially when you're younger at school you're you read books and you're kind of taught to analyze books in a way that you see this kind of narrative neatness in the sense that a story has a beginning a middle and an mm -hmm. end and there is like a resolution whereas when you get older you kind of realize that's not always the case and sometimes the books that are most worthwhile reading do not have that neat ending because having that kind of open ending or like unresolved tension mm. is what makes the book mm. more interesting mm. Um, yeah, I think it's particularly relevant in this novel, but um, I think like when you have questions of stuff like, when because we've talked about this book being quite polemic and controversial, mm. right? So I think there's no really way to have a narratively neat ending to a mm. book such as this because you want mm. to be spurring on conversations and almost debates and kind of questions mm. around whether like about you want to be questioning the stuff that was kind of widely accepted for a mm. long time so i think kind of garcia marquez was right to have 
kind of this more ambiguous ending yeah. that wouldn't have do, made sense. Do, do you remember, I mean, you, you may not know the answer to this question, but do you remember the, the very first sentence of the novel? I, I really don't. I'm so Because we're talking about neat endings, but actually there's quite a neat opening in mm -hmm. the sense that there's a foreshadowing of the general's death. Mm -hmm. In the very first sentence, we read that the general is in bathwater, I think, as far yeah. as I recall, and um, his aide thinks mm -hmm. that he's already died. So yeah. in very, you know, there in the very first sentence, we have this kind of neat ending foreshadowed so, yeah. already there. And one really interesting reason that I actually was taken to the book in the first place is I remember reading like a list of people's famous last words and I remember that Simon mm. Bolivar's is how, was I how will I ever get out of this labyrinth of suffering? Mm. So I think that's a really interesting, mm. um, yeah. talking about this kind of narrative beginning, middle and end, as mm. you said, like the beginning of this novel alone focuses on the fact that like they thought he was dead and there's kind mm. of an interesting kind of cyclical nature there. But even yeah. the end, it's still talking about this labyrinth and this like never ending passage of stuff that's unresolved. Yeah, that, that notion of a labyrinth of suffering actually brings mm -hmm. me on to something else I wanted to talk about, which mm -hmm. in your personal statement you discussed um, Elena Sabe by yeah. Claudia Piñero. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways you could you could describe Elena's life as a, as a labyrinth of suffering, sure. right? So what kind of labyrinth is Elena stuck in? Oh, there's, there's so much to unpack here, but I, I really I really love this novel because I think it's um, such an articulate and like there's so much to be read into it. And I think mm. Elena's life is very interesting in terms of this idea of the labyrinth of suffering, because I think she's not only oppressed by her um, illness because she has Parkinson's disease in the novel, mm -hmm. but I think the kind of disease and the way it's written is also kind of comes part and parcel with her role as a woman in Latin American society. Mm. And it's not just this Parkinson's disease that's kind of like impeding on her life it's also the pressures of the patriarchal society and I mean the book at its heart is about bodily autonomy in mm -hmm. the context of women and I think there's so many ways that can be interpreted in like modern day discussions around bodily autonomy because obviously stuff like reproductive rights is a very important part of that novel but I think it was a really interesting choice by the writer to also explore that in terms of illness and like mm -hmm. what it means to have bodily autonomy there because like so, so how does mm -hmm. the you said there the way it's written yeah. how does the way it's written reflect uh let's take one of these themes let's let's take uh, elena's age for mm -hmm. example or her illness how does the way it's written reflect how ill she actually is well i mean there's kind of a, quite a meandering sense to the narrative to Good. me personally like it's, it's in, in what sense meandering so it doesn't make it very clear what's happening in the book uh -huh. until you get mm. towards the end you're just kind you know that elena's kind of going on a journey she's got to go visit someone it, takes mm -hmm. a while to explain who she's visiting and why and I feel like you know that could kind of sometimes represent the thought processing of someone who's of an older age of like not always being very clear or to the point there's a very meandering sense there but I think also um a lot of the text is interrupted by like Eleanor's asides being like mm -hmm. oh my body hurts da, 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 da. and like that feels quite naturalistic and it kind of writes in quite um interestingly the way that her body really like overrides and um, has a lot of bearing on how she goes about her day to day mm. life. Um, just, yeah. just one final question mm -hmm. on yeah, this. Um, if I had to, to ask you to compare El General mm -hmm. and Elena Sabe yeah. in terms of in terms of the time frame that they're narrated over, how mm. would you compare them? Well, that that's a yeah, that's. It's a tough question. It's a I tough know. question because um, obviously Elena Sabe is kind of like I believe like a day yeah, essentially, good, so it's, it's it's a very short period of yeah. time. Whereas um, in general isn't particularly long either. I believe it's like over a few months. So it's like towards it's the end of his life. Much shorter than that. that actually. Like it's a couple of weeks. Weeks exactly. So it's a very short period of his life, um, and I think. Why, why do you think they make us think about time in that way, yeah. Elena? You know, what, what situation is Elena in? What situation is the, the, the general in? And why is time so important to them? Yeah, I think there's a strong sense of like cruciality of time uh -huh. because it's it, it's kind of the slightly morose implication in both of those novels yeah. that it's towards the end of their life. Yeah. So I think it's this idea, yeah, the idea of the cruciality of time. And even if it's only a day or a couple of weeks in their life, it's very important potentially final moments and the reflections I think from a, like from a creative and artistic perspective and when we reflect on like life and what a life lived mm. looks like sometimes those last moments mm. are the most fruitful mm -hmm. um and important to analyze Even so the I most think intense, intense exactly or, yeah, or the most meandering mm. or the yeah. most yeah um so yeah I definitely think like the kind of focus in a short period of time but at a very crucial part in one's life towards the end of one's life when they have the benefit of years of prior experience to reflect on mm. to then be like where why am i where i'm at now mm. is 
quite somber and sad actually in both of those situations because I think it comes with a lot of resentment and regret for both characters but I think it's also really important for maybe younger audiences or people such as myself who aren't at that point in life to maybe mm. have some of these questions and be thinking about like how the trajectory of one's life can change and mm. one's opinions on those mm. kind of things can change too. Mm. Probably worth so, yeah. thinking about life as a labyrinth, right? <laughs> yeah. In many ways. Okay, I mean, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. But we're going to have to move on now to discuss the, the passage that yeah. you've been working on. And obviously, in a post A level interview, we would jump into Spanish now, but we yeah. are going to stay in English. Um, so I'll hand over to Dr. Sugden to ask a first couple of questions. Thank you. So let's, again, start out with a question that, that, that you may well be, be anticipating in some sense. Could you tell us what this passage is about? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean... It's, it's an interesting passage because it's not super clear to me from the get-go. But um, if I had to harbor a guess, I would say this passage is about the narrator who seems to be a detective who's been enlisted by a secondary character um, who's just called the man in this passage mm-hmm. um, to investigate what's happened, like a disappearance or something like that, of a woman that's described in the first paragraph. Um, if I was to kind of make an inference, I would like guess maybe the woman that the narrator needs to investigate is like a past lover of the Mm -hmm. man um but there's like an interesting part in the second half of the passage where it's kind of a lot of reflections from the narrator and like Mm. what's the point in kind of investigating Mm -hmm. this and Mm -hmm. it's got a lot of kind of ruminations and thoughts about love and relationships which Mm -hmm. is interesting but yeah it's obviously kind of written intentionally not super linear and straightforward Mm -hmm. (laughs) um yeah Okay, so you, 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 you mentioned this sort of lack of, of linearity mm-hmm. that, that, that you see in the passage and you talk about ruminations from the narrator. I mean, is there, does there anything else strike you as interesting about the way it's written? Um, I kind of like the intertextuality or whatever you'd like to call it of the mm-hmm. idea of the fairy tales being um, written into it. Um, this is me kind of deviating, I apologise slightly from a question, but I think that's quite unique here but the reason I found it interesting in the context of this passage is I think when you're looking the first paragraph or like the first few lines is what kind of I find the most interesting about this passage so the specific use of word stuff like the woman seemed happy her smile at least and constantly referring to her smile Mm. so I think for me one thing I after reading it a few times through I felt like what I could gather from this passage alone like a reflection I would have is maybe talking about the idea of like kind of perception versus reality mm-hmm. and i think that's quite important then enlisting the use of like a fairy tale as a okay. motif to explore that because mm-hmm. it's the idea of like um, a fairy tale is something everyone kind of knows the moral of the story behind and it's like kind of maybe exploring the idea of like deconstructing something that we thought we knew really well so mm-hmm. i think like that first passage ties into the idea of like this fairy tale like the woman is like a fairy tale character like she seems happy she seems like this uh, it appears that way but is there maybe more than meets the eye there kind of like a fairy tale what do you make of the the actual i mean you're right to say that she mm-hmm. seems happy and, mm-hmm. and we describe her smile mm-hmm. but how do we describe the smile in line two um was enormous and contagious contagious, contagious yeah and then what um something viral yeah. yeah what does that tell us about the smile about the person about mm. you know, the fairy tale that might be being told here there's something i don't know if this is the answer you're looking for but there's something a bit uncanny about it to mm-hmm. me because like something viral a mm. smile is kind of viral you know to me i don't know if it's just because i've lived through the covid years kind of has negative connotations there it feels like mm-hmm. something that's kind of like almost venomous or just mm. not always have the best connotations and to describe something like a smile which is probably meant to be the embodiment of happiness and joy and stuff like that as viral feels quite kind of contradictory or like yeah yeah, different there so I think to me there's something uncanny about the way it's described like contagious and viral is it yeah that's like quite specific choice of words to me is there anything uncanny about the way she's described physically in lines two to four Mm. The woman, the kind of the idea of like the woman spinning on her own axis. Yeah, it's not accessory. really a usual description of a yeah. person, is it? There's quite a lot of, yeah, kind of removal of the humanistic features about mm-hmm. this woman. Mm-hmm. So 
there is kind of almost like an objectification there. The woman spinning on her own axis is kind of, I don't know, all I can think of as like a globe or something, mm. like, like a literal object. And then the idea of her smile, smile being viral and contagious is, you know, it, it takes away a lot of like the human traits that one would probably associate with describing abusive or alluring mm. like, mm. women. Is she um, the only person who smiles in this passage? Um, he... The man begins to smile, stupefied. I remember reading that. So yeah, just under the bit, off the bit that's underlined. I said mm. more to myself than to the man who began to smile, stupefied. So mm. the man smiles. As I don't, well. wh why is he stupefied at that point? I mean, so the underlined line I think is probably quite an interesting thing to unpack. <laughs> and, it is underlined. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's it's interesting because. You read the beginning bit and you're like, you, you see the bit that says, so is she handsome or grassy? You're like, okay, am I reading a fairy tale? But then you're kind of like, no, this is just, they're using fairy tales as like a reference point. But if you think about it as a natural conversation to show, let's say I showed a picture to my friend of, I don't know, my sister in a red dress. And then they said, oh, so is she handsome or grassy? That's a very unnatural kind of conversation mm. or something to mm. go ne say next. But I think then the bit that's underlined is even more kind of, strange or maybe abnormal of a conversation but there is something important in that and it's clear that the man reacting to it has picked up on that so the fact that the man says Gretel I suppose because that feels like the obvious answer you know seeing a woman in a red dress and you've asked is it Hansel or Gretel because of basic mm. gender conventionality and what's what not Gretel I suppose but then the fact that the narrator replies is it, is is it like, about gender there pardon do, do you think it's about gender when 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 we ask that question in line mm. five Hansel or Gretel that's a good question. I think from the answer, I just assumed it was kind of like mm. a very thoughtless response mm -hmm. that it's a girl in a red dress looking happy. So therefore she must be the little girl in that story. Mm. Like it just makes more sense. But I don't think that ne may necessarily be the intentionality behind why the narrator asks the question. Um, and yeah, and I think it's interesting then the underlined bit about like, maybe she's a woodsman witch or the woman who wants to get rid of her children like that feels like it's taken what the conversation started with and like really redirected it and made mm -hmm. it a lot more like almost alarming for the person why is that alarming well i think th it's not that the conversation started out seeming more innocent but to jump from hansel and gretel which are like meant to be children characters that are like quite naive and you know mm. just trying to get out of the the word without being werewolf or whatever um, but isn't, i mean isn't this entirely what a detective would do yeah right mm. you know someone would say is it a or b and a detective would say ah well let's think about c d and e as well yeah right for sure. i mean in, in some ways she does really come across like a detective in the first half yeah that's not really the case in the second half no why does she not seem like a detective in the second half of the passage yeah, I think the first half of the passage is very investigative and yeah, there's like a good. lot of questions and there's clearly curiosity um, there. Whereas in the second half, you know, like the second bit that's underlying, like I would say to at the end, many days later when my hair was much longer, that no one ever knows why there's a sense of finality and so that like stuff is unsolvable and that the detective themselves is like happy with that resolution, that stuff is unsolvable. They're not looking to find mm -hmm. extra answers where they don't believe there are yeah. any. Um, so I think there's a very different, there's very much um, a change in attitude towards what they're doing. You mm. know, like the first bit is very inquisitive, whereas the second bit is quite final and like, mm. we don't mm. really know and that's okay. Do you see that reflected in the style of the passage and the way that the second half is written compared mm. to the first? Well, I think maybe the tense, like I mm -hmm. would, is kind of implying in the future. So they already know what they're doing there and then. There's not like a possibility for room for stuff changing. Well, that, that that's mm. kind of, interesting in mm. terms of tense right because the, the narrator is also some kind of recounting something that happened mm -hmm. so i took the money i took the briefcase i told him yes i would take the case of the mad couple mm -hmm. um, mm. i would solve his riddle i would say to him at the end mm -hmm. so is, is, is that really a conditional in the way that that you sort of describe it mm. I think, like, obviously it's kind of a conditional tense, but I think it's sent, said with a sense of kind of finality or certainty there. Mm. It's, yeah, it's almost kind of feels a bit stubborn, being mm. like, I'm going to do this to prove a point. Mm. And I think when you read that paragraph, sorry, from like the but I took the money until the end of that paragraph as a whole, it feels quite stubborn. Because um, it's this whole thing about, like, I would take the thing, I would, I would sorry, I would solve his riddle, I would take his, I would take on the case, I would say to him, and then he already knows what he's going to do after that. So it's kind of like mm. the beginning bit's mm. quite stubborn in him trying to prove, sorry, the narrator trying to prove a point. 
Yeah, but yeah. I think it, I think it's interesting you 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 say stubborn because mm-hmm. if you look, I mean, sort of from from line twenty onwards, there's kind of a hesitance mm-hmm. here as well, right? So, I think I took his money in the briefcase. Yeah. Um, I remember that I remembered or might have remembered it. So, how do you kind of square that stubbornness with the those feelings of hesitancy? Mm. I think like the passage very much kind of takes you on a journey with the narrator so like you've, we've talked about there's kind of like a tonal and a confidence change in each bit and I think obviously the final line really really hammers at home with the I think their sense seems to be almost kind of like a self-consciousness there but I don't know if that's actually what it is in the case of this narrator personally um sorry I'm just sorry, rereading take, the text take your time, take your time. Mm-hmm. Take Yeah, that kind of goes from being like what I would call a level of stubbornness and certainty there mm-hmm. um, to him almost kind of wanting to qualify in his own mind why he took on the case because he's just told us, sorry, the narrator's just told us um, as a reader, like, I did it because of this. But then they kind of second guess that and qualify it saying, well, I think I did it actually because I wanted to do this. So there's like a level of certainty there, but then like a level of self-awareness that mm. wants to kind of qualify mm. that. And then we get into the final line. Um, kind of, yeah, really reflecting on that. Let, let's look at the, mm-hmm. the very final line yeah. of the entire passage. I remember that I remembered or might have remembered it. Mm. It doesn't sound very self-assured or no, stubborn. Not at all. Why um, do we end with that? It's, it's not something you might hear a detective say. No. <laughs> stereotypically. Yeah, sorry, I'm just reading this through again. Um, hmm. I feel like, yeah, like like you said, it's something that's not very self-assured coming mm-hmm. from the director. But I think so much of this passage talks a little bit about kind of these quite abstract concepts, mm-hmm. such as, you know, this idea of being in love and being out of love. And I think remember is like the word that really st- i mean it's repeated so much i have mm-hmm. like it not stick out to me in the mm-hmm. final line but i think this idea of like memory and um i think this concept of being in love and out of love i find quite interesting in like media and literature specifically mm-hmm. the idea of people remembering being in love being a certain way but then if you actually was reflect on it and look at it objectively mm-hmm. it's like was all the great bits really good or are you just remembering the great bits and i think that last line is probably an allusion to that maybe like this Mm -hmm. idea that even the narrator who has very clear-cut views and that the sorry the other the man character probably hasn't remembered their love with this person they're trying to investigate Mm -hmm. in the way they think they have even this narrator who seems to have a very like almost like omniscient like very wise perspective Mm -hmm. on this Mm -hmm. still can't remember stuff for themselves so it's this idea of like memory kind of distorting yeah our mm-hmm. own relationship like relationships and stuff yeah we have it there right there in line 16 and 17 yeah. no one knows in the end no one knows yeah. no one can be sure mm-hmm. right i'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there because we've run out of time um but thank you very much thank for you. coming to see us today um do you have any questions for us at this stage um i don't think i do you don't thank you yeah, no thank you well thank you very much and uh we'll show you out thank you thank you so thank much, you very much. <laughs> bye Hi. Uh, so we'll have a bit of reflection on the interview now. Um, I guess the question that everyone always asks is, is, what does it feel like afterwards, particularly for you, Ruby, as a candidate? How do you feel that um, went? I think it went all right. I think sometimes I like deviated from the point and I was trying to be really conscious to make sure that even if I was mentioning a more abstract point that I was relating it to languages and language study. And I'm not sure if I always did that like amazingly. But I think it went all right overall. But I think maybe if I could do something differently, I would make some of my answers a little bit shorter and stick, like, deviate from the point a little bit less. But it'll be interesting to hear what <laughs> you yeah. Shall we switch over to the interviewers then? So same question to you. What are your reflections on how that interview went? Because it sounded amazing. From the yeah, I thought it was, it was a wonderful interview. I would let you in again. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. I think, uh, you know, you were wonderfully, you were making great links between some of the things that you'd read. Um, you probably noticed a couple of times I kept drawing you back to give me some examples mm-hmm. from the text. So yeah. um, it's always good to give examples from from whatever text you're talking about to back up what you're saying. Yeah. But in general, I thought uh, it was a really, a really good performance. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. And, and I think 
you know, part of our role as interviewer is if uh, an interview candidate, if they do, if we do feel like they're straying a little bit from the point, we're also there to, to bring them back. So I think if an interviewer does interrupt you mm. or, you know, as we, we, we did step in a couple of times, I think that's, that doesn't mean you've done something wrong necessarily. It's a way, I think, of allowing you to perform to the best of your ability. And I thought you responded really well to that, actually, when you were brought back. Um, and I thought, generally speaking, you had a really nice balance between those, you know, more more, more abstract, um, conceptually sophisticated considerations, but but you were able to, you know, ground that in, in textual detail when, you know, when, when Jeff prompted you to do so. There was also one point where you said, I'm not sure if this is the answer you're looking uh, for. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, we're not looking for a particular mm -hmm. answer. So, um, you know, we're just really looking to have a discussion with you and, and see where the discussion goes rather than, you know, nailing the right answer on the first go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ruby, could I ask you a little bit more about the experience of having the unseen text? So before the interview, you were sent the passage that you were discussing in the second half of the interview. What was that like? Because for some candidates, that can be quite a scary part of the experience or they think it might be. Yeah, I mean, for context for today's interview, I had kind of two little target questions, one about what the narrative voice is like in the text and then I believe one about focusing on certain lines underlined. Mm -hmm. So I think from my experience, the most important or useful thing to do is probably read the text through a few times. Um, for me personally, before even focusing on those questions, I wanted to make sure I kind of understood what was going on in the text. And I mean, from what I remember of my original interview, and I know this can be the case for like a lot of people doing English and other degrees, sometimes it's not always very clear what mm. the text yeah. is about. But I think um, try and work out what you can understand from certain paragraphs or lines and try and ground that in... Um, if you're making assumptions or inferences about stuff, kind of explain why you've made those assumptions to an interviewer, because as far as I'm aware, I think that helps them understand your thought process. Yeah. Um, and then, so do that kind of before even tackling those first few questions, mm -hmm. and then try and not necessarily think outside the box, but don't be kind of dissuaded if maybe something that feels quite pertinent or is like bugging you thinking about it. Mm -hmm. If you think, oh, but that may not be what they're thinking mm -hmm. of like at least maybe mention it and give it a go and if you get the vibe that it's really not yeah. what you've completely <laughs> we'll interpreted you it fair enough but it's yeah. always worth giving it a go because you could be kind of tackling something that's like people have never thought about before and that mm -hmm. the interview would be mm -hmm. interested to hear from you mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. worth saying as well that we discussed mm -hmm. that in english yeah. if you are studying post a level languages or post ib languages we would do that in the target language mm -hmm. but of course the questions would be much easier mm -hmm. right we wouldn't we wouldn't be at that kind of high, high level, level that we were in english yeah yeah, and I think it's also worth saying that that when Cambridge Admissions interviewers choose passages, they are going to be looking for something that will challenge you. Mm. So if you, as an interview candidate, find yourself looking at a text, you think, oh my God, I have no idea what's going on. So that's not what we aim for. We're not trying mm. to trip anybody up, but we're also trying to push you to show us what you're capable of. So there probably will be things that feel a bit uncertain, there may well be words in your post-A level language that you haven't encountered um, before. That's completely normal and completely fine. Mm. We do not expect you to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, we're interested in how you, in your thought process, to get to the answers that you give us. Mm. Um, final question for Rebecca and Jeff. Did you have all the questions that you asked Ruby planned there, or did it Sort of develop more organically as the interview uh, progressed? We had the first two questions planned, which was, why do you want to study modern languages? <laughs> and what happens in this text? But apart from that, nothing else. Not Be all. Rebecca and I hadn't talked about this beforehand. This was, <laughs> you know, as close to an admissions interview as possible in that sense. We hadn't discussed with Ruby any of the questions beforehand. So this was a pretty, a pretty good example of, a, mm -hmm. of an admissions interview and how it might progress.